Welcome back to Church in the World. This is part two of our study of economic life, which is the social statement, Sufficient Sustainable Livelihood for All from the ELCA. And that is going to be today, part two. We're going to talk about livelihood, and tomorrow we'll talk about sustainable and sufficient. We already talked about for all and how the economy is called to be a way in which we as Christians serve and provide for the poor and redistribute wealth so that they are able to have their basic needs met. And we'll talk about what that those basic needs are, sufficiency, uh, tomorrow. What we're going to talk about today in part two of this discussion is livelihood, vocation, work, and human dignity. So let's begin with vocation. So our calling from God, vocation means calling, begins in the waters of baptism and is lived out in a wide array of settings and relationships, right? And you, you all know this. Uh, you're, you're called to be a parent, you're called to be a child, you're called to be a student, you're called to be a, a, a beekeeper or a woodworker or an academic or a doctor or a nurse or a bartender or whatever it is. Free through the gospel, we are to serve others through these arenas of responsibility, family, work, community, life, Although we continue to be ensnared in the ambiguities and sin of this world, our vocation is to seek what is good for people and the rest of creation in ways that glorify God and anticipate God's promised future. So what is livelihood? Livelihood means our means of subsistence. It's how we are supported economically. Paid jobs, self-employment, business ownership, accumulated wealth, support of family, community networks, government assistance, all part of livelihood. Strong families, neighborhoods, and schools should support and help prepare persons for livelihood. Churches, businesses, financial institutions, government, civil society also play key roles. Through these relationships, people can be enabled and obligated to pursue their livelihoods as they are able. When these infrastructures for livelihood are absent, weak, or threatened, as they are from end of the day, people are more likely to be impoverished materially, emotionally, or spiritually. Through the relationships and structures that create our livelihood, individuals can learn important virtues, such as trust, accountability, fidelity in relationships, discipline, honesty, diligence, and responsibility in work, frugality, prudence, and temperance in the use of resources, compassion and justice toward other people and the rest of creation. We commit ourselves as a church and urge members to develop God-given capacities and provide stable, holistic, loving development of children and youth through families, neighborhoods, congregations, and other institutions, right? So part of uh, vocation is caring for children, very important to remember, and therefore that's part of economic life for those who think that taxes shouldn't fund schools, although I know none of you are on uh, watching this video, but there are people who will say that, and that's a violation of how we understand vocation and, and the vocation of parents and of society and of teachers, right? We call for Policies that promote stable families, strong schools, and safer neighborhoods. We call for addressing the barriers individuals face in preparing for and sustaining a livelihood, such as lack of education, there's education again, or transportation, or childcare, or healthcare, right? All of these things need to be provided or somehow accessible so that people can prepare for livelihood. Now then there's work. Work in Genesis is a means through which basic needs might be met, as human beings still and keep the garden in which God has placed them, Genesis 2.15. Work, it's very important, is not seen as an end in and of itself. Work is a means for sustaining humans and the rest of creation. Due to sin, the work God gives to humans also becomes toil and anguish. Injustice often deprives people of the fruits of their work, which benefits others instead. God calls people to use their freedom and responsibility, their capacities and know-how to participate productively in God's world. But what matters in most jobs today, or many, rather than a sense of vocation, is the satisfaction of wants or desires that the pay from work makes possible. Work becomes a means toward increased consumerism, not serving the other and providing for the world. Many also feel a constant sense of being judged, having to measure up according to an unrelenting bottom line of productivity or profit. We are freed from such economic captivity by the forgiveness, new life, and dignity that is ours in Christ. Competing and competitive economic forces, as well as changing technologies and consumer demands, significantly affect the kinds of jobs available and the nature of work. 
A growing proportion of jobs are part-time, temporary, or contractual without the longevity and security assumed in the past. Workers in the United States increasingly produce services rather than tangible goods. Many people choose to be self-employed. A large number lose their jobs when companies merge, downsize, or move to areas with lower labor costs. Job transitions can be enriching, but also can be painful. Feeling invested in one's job as a calling or being able to count on a future livelihood can be difficult when work is continually in flux. Many workers feel treated as if they are dispensable. Amid these changes, our faith reminds us our security and livelihood rests ultimately in God. We are grounded in God's promise that people shall long enjoy the work of their hands, Isaiah 65, 21. And this gives us courage to ask why changes are occurring. To challenge forces of greed and injustice when they deny some people what they need to live and when necessary to seek new possibilities for a livelihood. We as church commit to and urge members to deliberate together about the challenges people face in their work. We commit to counsel and support those who are unemployed, underemployed, and undergoing job transition. We commit to providing skill and language enhancement training that will enable the most vulnerable, including new immigrants, to become better prepared for jobs. And we call for public and private sector partnerships to create jobs and job retention programs. And we call for national economic policies that support and advance the goal of low unemployment, right? Now, everyone should agree with these things, right? But you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how many folks would object to the idea of equipping people for job retention, right? To uh, teaching uh, language tools and other professional skills for free to those who might want them so that they can work and have a better work relationship with their work and therefore a better livelihood. It's basic church, these are basic church teachings. And finally, human dignity is a very important part of livelihood. You see, human beings are created in God's image, Genesis 1. We are social beings whose dignity, worth, and value are conferred by God. Our identity does not depend on what we do, but through our work, we should be able to express our God-given dignity as persons of integrity, worth, and meaning. Yet, work does not constitute the whole of our life. When we are viewed and treated only as workers, we tend to be exploited. Employers have a responsibility to treat employees with dignity and respect. This should be reflected in employees' remuneration, benefits, work conditions, job security, and ongoing job training. Employees have a responsibility to work to the best of their build potential in a reliable and responsible manner. This includes work habits, attitudes towards employers and coworkers, and a willingness to adapt and prepare for new work situations. No one should be coerced to work under conditions that violate their dignity or freedom, jeopardize their health or safety, result in neglect of their family's well-being, or provide unjust compensation for their labor, right? Now think about this. No one should be coerced to work under conditions that violate their dignity or freedom, right? And that's kind of obvious for everybody, I would hope. Jeopardize their health or safety. Ooh, hold on. What about people who are working 20-hour weeks? What about people, 20-hour uh, days? What about people who uh, are working in dangerous areas? What, remember to unpack this stuff a little bit. No one should be, should be coerced to work under conditions that result in neglect of their family's well-being. Wow. So overwork is a serious problem then here. No one should be coerced to work under conditions that provide unjust compensation for their labor. Being underpaid is a violation of human dignity in this church. So when we have these discussions as a society about, um, about things like the minimum wage, keep that in mind. So what's the, what's the commitments? We commit ourselves as church too. Hire without discriminating on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, age, disability, sexual orientation, or genetic factors. We commit to compensate all people we call or employ at an amount sufficient for them to live in dignity. We commit to provide adequate pension and health benefits, safe and healthy work conditions, sufficient periods of rest, vacation, and sabbatical, and family-friendly work schedules. 
We commit to cultivate participatory workplaces, support the right of employees to organize for the sake of better working conditions, and to engage in collective bargaining, and refrain from intentionally undercutting union organizing activities or from permanently replacing striking workers. So this is more or less pro-union. This is pro-benefits. Uh, this is pro-equal employment. Um, without uh, regard to any num number of discriminatory fa uh, factors against which people are discriminated uh, on the basis of. Uh, adequate pension, health benefits from work. I don't know about you guys. I, I, haven't, I don't have a lot of friends who have jobs that meet this criteria. It's not common in our society, and that should give us pause. So what then does, do we call for in terms of livelihood? We call for other employers to engage in similar practices to these that we just listed, right? We call for government enforcement of regulations against discrimination, exploitative work conditions and labor practices, including child labor, and for the right of workers to organize and bargain collectively. There's the pro-union stuff again. Note that there's a lot of anti-union states, right? Uh, the, the right to work uh, type of legislation is fundamentally anti-unionizing. It's anti-organizing. It's anti-collective -bar bargaining, okay? Um, so that means those, those policies are contrary to the call of the, of the ELCA. We call for public policies that ensure adequate social security, unemployment insurance, and health care coverage, right? Ensure, right? Not make available. Ensure adequate social security, adequate unemployment insurance, adequate health care coverage. And it doesn't say just to workers. It says that generally. Remember, this is the livelihood. We call for a minimum wage level that balances employees' need for sufficient income with what would be significant negative effects on overall employment. Interesting way of phrasing this. What they're saying is, obviously, you can't raise the minimum wage so high that it's impossible to employ a huge amount of people. Um, but there's a problem, right? Because what we're experiencing economically as a society, as we've already said, is a lot of jobs are becoming part-time. Um, Part-time jobs are designed to be unsustainable. That's the point, right? And so we we have to. That, that's something that has to be teased out in the policy as we study uh, unemployment, as we study the connection or lack thereof between that and sufficient income. We also call for tax credits, another means of supplementing the income insufficient income of low-paid workers in order to move them out of poverty. Right. So look how many policy actionable policy things are going on here. Right. People should have the right to organize. People should be provided with and insured of health care, pensions, and unemployment insurance, right? Folks should be able to organize and unionize. This is really important stuff. This is, this is written from 1999. It is 2021. And I'm telling you right now, I have heard people rail against some of these things in our current political discourse as though they were completely un-American ideas and they've been clearly in circulation for a long while. So where does this all lead, right? Well, in terms of livelihood, what I wanna leave you with today is that livelihood uh, is not just how much money we earn. It's the way we structure our society to care for everybody, whether they are currently employed or not, whether they were ever employed or not, right? Livelihood is that which is necessary for life and that which we provide to flourish with flourish human dignity, to allow people to follow their vocations and to provide work for those who wish to do work, right? So, so this is very important. And what it is then to have a sufficient livelihood and what it is to make a community and society of livelihoods that are sustainable is going to be the question we tackle tomorrow. So I hope you'll join me then. And until that time, Take care and God bless.